Hi, in this video, we'll take a look at a 600 MHz to 6 GHz 4x4 panel antenna. This thing is massive. Just to get you an idea, here is my 18-inch ruler, and you can see that diagonally it measures just above 18 inches. This one was sent in from a company called Waveform. According to the datasheet, this antenna supports four very wide frequency bands that covers pretty much the entire commercial cell phone signal spectrum. Sometimes you'll hear the term UWB, or ultra-wideband, when people talk about antennas, and this antenna certainly falls into that category. I will leave a product link in the video description below, so you can check it out if you are interested. If you recall, I did a teardown of another MIMO panel antenna a while back. That antenna is a dual-band antenna, and essentially consists of two sets of cross-polarized dipole antennas one set for each frequency band, and a diplexer that is used to multiplex the two frequency contents. This antenna is much bigger because it supports four independent input-output channels, and you can see that from the four coaxes coming out from this antenna. The spec also indicated that this antenna, like the one we looked at before, is also cross-polarized. So a couple of questions come to mind. The first question is, what techniques does this MIMO antenna incorporate to achieve this ultra-wide bandwidth? The second question is, how does it reduce mutual coupling between the antenna array elements? Let's open it up and see if we can find out the answers. By the way, for those who don't know what a MIMO antenna is, MIMO stands for multiple inputs and multiple outputs, as you can see in the number of connecting cables we have here. MIMO antennas essentially use multiple sets of antennas for increased signal diversity. Without getting into too much detail, the increased signal diversity directly translates into higher throughput of the communication channel, therefore allowing faster data rate. Signal diversity also increases the signal-to-noise ratio with the added diversity gain. I have already removed all the mounting screws at the back, so let me just remove the dome and we'll see what is underneath. Wow, this is quite a bit different than what I had imagined. What you can immediately see is that essentially all four antennas are mostly identical, besides their orientations. This means that each antenna is covering the entire four frequency bands between 600 MHz and 6 GHz. We will take a closer look at each individual antenna element momentarily. Because each antenna covers the full bandwidth, a noticeable difference between this design and the design we saw in the previous dual-band MIMO antenna is that there's no need for multiplexing antennas for different frequency bands, and therefore the feeding system is very simple. Now, if I lift it up, you can see that each of these antennas are individually fed, and there are no connections amongst them whatsoever. So, in this regard, this design is noticeably simpler, in my opinion. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove this one antenna off from the stand here so it will be a lot easier to see as the back end here is reflective and the lighting does not look ideal here. So let me do that and we'll be back momentarily. Okay, I think I freed up the bottom antenna and in the process, unfortunately, I broke a few of these clips. These are really fragile, but it doesn't matter that much. Now, if I lift this up, you can see that. This antenna is essentially the same as the antenna up here. They're just rotated by 90 degrees. So let's uh, take a closer look at this one. Now, of course, if you take a closer look at each of the antenna elements, you can see that the design is actually quite complex. This all can attribute to modern computerized antenna design. The basic principles in RF designs are fairly well known. For simple solutions, such as a dipole design, you can solve field equations with boundary conditions analytically and get the results. But for more complex antenna shapes, there typically is no analytic solution. Rather, it is usually done via computer simulations using high-frequency electromagnetic simulation software, or HFSS, utilizing finite element analysis. While I studied antenna theories in both undergraduate and graduate schools quite extensively, 
I did not end up being an RF engineer, so my real-world exposure to modern antenna designs are quite limited, and there's a lot of guesswork on my end based on my understanding. So if you are a professional RF engineer specialized in patch antenna design, please correct me in the comment below if anything I'm saying here is incorrect. And if you can add your own explanations, I would greatly appreciate that. Let's first take a look at how the ultra wide bandwidth is achieved. There are some general rule of thumb. For instance, if you want to increase the bandwidth of an antenna, you can increase the diameter or aperture of the driven element. Another common technique is to introduce some parasitic elements or dummy elements on the same plane of the driven element. The general idea is that the resonant frequencies of these parasitic elements are slightly different than the driven element, so the overall frequency response is the superposition of all the elements combined together. Also, you can have some kind of multi-layered parasitic elements like what we see here on both sides of the antenna here. The orientation of these dummy elements align with the induced electric field. Because within each set of the antenna element is 90 degree rotated compared to the other one, intuitively you can see that the polarization of these two adjacent antennas are orthogonal as the patches are perpendicular to one another. So we know on either side, the antenna on the top and the antenna at the bottom are cross-polarized. If you look at any of these individual antennas, you will see that there are some shiny patches. And uh, these patches are not connected to anything here. All these are parasitic elements, and uh, their purposes, I believe, are to enhance the overall bandwidth of the antenna. Another technique for enhancing the bandwidth are the use of these internal slots here. Because of the top and the bottom antenna on each side are cross-polarized, the coupling between them are minimal. But that's only half of the story. How does it effectively reduce the mutual coupling between these two sets of antennas? After all, you can see that the bottom two and the top two antennas are identical, so their polarizations are the same, and the spacing between these antennas are relatively close. So without precautions, the mutual coupling between these sets will be huge, and it will cause the loss of spectral efficiency and the degradation of the MIMO system performance. Minimizing the mutual coupling is actually one of the key design goals of compact MIMO system like this one. This is where pattern diversity comes into play. Pattern diversity in this case ensures that the overlapping of radiation patterns of these antennas are minimized. Remember, because the overall antenna is very compact, we cannot use spatial diversity to physically separate out each individual antennas apart by multiple wavelengths. So we have to rely on either polarization diversity, which we have already utilized between these two sets of uh, antennas, or pattern diversity, or a combination of both to minimize mutual coupling. If you follow the feed line into any of these antennas, you will see that they are not only independent, but they don't even share a common ground. We can actually further validate this by using a multimeter. So here I have multimeter in buzzer mode. You can see that. This is one of the end connector, and we place it on the other end connector. You can see that they are actually not connected at all. And further, the aluminum backplane is not connected to anything either. As you can see here, for example, this is the aluminum backplane. And you can see that if I put this uh, measurement here on the end connector, and again, it's not connected at all. You can see here. So the entire aluminum backplane serves as a parasitic element rather than the ground plane you typically find in other antenna designs. Okay, let's just concentrate on one of the antennas. And if we examine the feed line here, you will see that it feeds into this piece on the right-hand side, and this connects to this metal piece here. And the other side is the ground, which connects to this metal piece, which surrounds the driven element here. So let's buzz it out and uh, to confirm. Again, I have my multimeter here, and uh, let's take a look. This is our N connector here. So if you take a look, the outside, which is ground, and that's connected to this piece. And this piece is all around, surrounding the half of the, this uh, driving element here. 
And uh, let's uh, take a look at the driving element. If I go to the center of the end connector, you can see that that is connected to this piece. And uh, this piece is not connected to this piece as we talked about earlier. These two shiny pieces here are the parasitic elements. And of course, there's another parasitic element at the bottom here. I put this piece back temporarily so you can see its relation to all the other pieces. Because of the ground trace goes all the way around, you can see here, and they're surrounding the driven element here. So given the placement of all these antennas, you can see that the driving element of each of the antenna is always separated by a ground plane. For instance here, this is the driving element for this antenna, and you can see that here is the ground, and here is our ground, and here is our ground. So similarly for the other antennas as well, this antenna is pointed outward, so it doesn't really matter, but it's separated by this ground plane. And similarly, this one is placed outward too, so this is your driving element. And the driving element on this side is right here. The placement of the ground trace alters the radiation patterns of the two adjacent antennas of the same radiation pattern, so they don't significantly overlap. The slight offset between each pair also helps in this regard. If you look carefully, there are some other features on these antennas I'd like to point out. First is that these antennas are largely identical, but they're not exactly identical. If you take a look at these two antennas, you will see that towards uh, on the ground side, there is a piece of tab that is uh, soldered onto the ground element. And we have one here as well. So let me just zoom in a little more. You can see that these pieces is what I'm talking about here. And these are not on the other two antennas. My guess is that they are used to fine tune the radiation patterns here. Also, let me zoom in a little bit more. If you see the ground trace on each of the antenna elements, you will see a piece that appears to be soldered on after the fact. My guess is that in field testing, the original design did not quite meet the requirements. Therefore, they had to do some fine adjustment work without having to redo the molds for stamping out these metal pieces. If you look underneath each of these antenna elements, you will see there are three pieces of these metal stands. Presumably, they're used to fine-tune the frequency response and or adjust the radiation pattern. I bet the angles these pieces are at are meticulously adjusted, not just done willy-nilly. In RF engineering, everything you see has a purpose. So that was the analysis. Now let's do some measurements to see how this antenna behaves. Now before I do that, I wanted to put this piece back so that at least we can measure the entire antenna in its original configuration. Okay, I just hooked it up to the nano VNA. By the way, the nano VNA I have currently can only scan up to three gigahertz. So in this video, we'll just look at the two lower bands from 600 to 960 megahertz for the first band and 1.7 gigahertz to 2.7 gigahertz for the second frequency bands. And if I get a better equipment in the future, I will test the 3.3 to 6 gigahertz bands as well. Also, you can see that it's a little bit of dark because I have to turn off the overhead light so that we don't get a glare from the nano VNA screen. You can see it a little bit better. And uh, let me just quickly explain what is connected to what, as it is very difficult to get everything into the same picture here. The S11 port currently is hooked up to the bottom left of the antenna in that antenna array, and uh, the S21 port is hooked up to the antenna above it. So these two antennas are orthogonally polarized. Therefore, we're measuring the return loss for S11 for the one antenna, and also at the same time, measuring the coupling between these two antennas to see how well the isolation is across the entire operation bandwidth. So from the current screen, you can see that between 50 kilohertz and uh, 3 gigahertz, the yellow line shows you the return loss from a single antenna, and uh, the cyan line shows you the coupling between these two antennas. 
Before I narrow in to the actual frequency bands, I just want to swap out the S21 port to a different antenna. This time I'm going to be using the bottom right one. So essentially, this antenna is the same antenna as the one we're measuring on the S11 port. Same in the sense that these two antennas have the same polarization. And let's see how well they are isolated. So now you can see that even for the two adjacent antennas of the same polarization, the isolation between them are actually pretty good as well. Now let's uh, narrow in to the 600 to 960 frequency band. Now you're looking at a SWR plot between 500 megahertz and 1.1 gigahertz. So if you recall, the antenna is specified for the first frequency band between 600 megahertz and 960 megahertz. And right now my cursor is at just above 600 megahertz. And you can see that the SWR is roughly in line with or lower than two between this frequency band. And you can see that largely everything is uh, indeed within the specified range. Now we're looking at the SWR plot between 1.5 gigahertz and uh, 3 gigahertz, which is a slightly outside of the band of the specified range of uh, 1.7 to 2.7 gigahertz. And you can see how impressive this is. For the entire bandwidth, you can see that the marker actually stayed under the SWR of 2. And it only crept up here. Let's just see what that frequency is. And just to remind you that here is our 1.7 gigahertz. You can see that SWR is under 2. It's 1.43. And if we drag it, if I can, if I drag it to the 2.7 gigahertz, which is the specified maximum range, you can see that the SWR stays well below that 2.0 specified maximum. And I have no doubt that the 3 gigahertz to 6 gigahertz bands also falls within the specification. Of course, right now I don't have a nano VNA can measure up to that high frequency. But if I do get one, I will do the experiment again and share it with you guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. Please remember to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. I will catch up with you next time.